elongated skulls. Now, I'm betting as soon as you hear that, that you think of Peru. And there's a good reason for that. Throughout the, the press, obviously in the last few years, we've seen images of some incredible skulls from Peru, from, particularly from the Paracas culture. Now, at times people have said, you know, could these be aliens? Could they be, you know, uh, giants, fallen angels? All sorts of strange claims have been made. The reason for that is just how extremely odd they look. I mean, these are real skulls. They're not, uh, you know, fabricated in some way. Uh, and so they have to be explained. There has to be some reason for them being so bizarre with, you know, certain examples looking like they're, you know, they appear to be twice the size of a normal skull, certainly, you know, twice as tall or twice as long. They're, you know, they are incredibly odd. Now, the Paracas culture existed from around 3,000 years ago to about 2,000 years ago. And they were extraordinary in other ways. They had a complex sort of irrigation system. They made incredible pottery, very fine weaving, and had a complex spiritual system. It's only a shamanic culture involving, well, involving veneration and use of skulls, funnily enough. Because we know that some of the burials were, were dug up later on. Skulls were removed, used in some way, and then would be buried again separately later on. So clearly they had, you know, a focus on skulls, even amongst the culture when it was there. So there is something very strange, you know, in relation to the Paracas people. And you only need to look at the most, you know, the most extreme examples of their elongated skulls to be, you know, left quite shocked and feel that, you know, like something really odd and anomalous is going on here. Now, to understand the backstory of these skulls, you have to go beyond Peru, in fact, beyond the Americas, because elongated skulls are not simply a feature of that continent. They've been found all across the world. You know, you, they found them in, in England, France, Germany. They've been found in the Caucasus region, uh, in the Levant, um, the Middle East, across into Siberia, uh, essentially right across the world, like all the continents of the world, well, the inhabited, shall I say, inhabited continents of the world have got examples of elongated skulls. And indeed, the practice was still continuing in some areas until quite recent times. And I'm sure that there are still some places where it does happen. Um, if we look at Vanuatu, for example, um, it was happening into modern times, as in some parts of Papua New Guinea. And I believe some parts of Africa as well. But, you know, it's only perhaps in the last century. It may have now faded out, but certainly in in modern times, people were still binding the heads of children and reshaping them to give them this sort of long conical form. Why? You know, you have to ask why? Why is something so strange and extreme? You know, and, and why is it so widespread? I mean, are we supposed to believe that, you know, disparate groups with no contact all came up with this same strange idea independently of each other? I mean, is that reasonable? I mean, this is as strange as saying that, you know, People decided that they're going to cut off their left hand, you know, for some sort of spiritual reasons. And then finding that that is happening everywhere and saying that everybody's come up with the idea independently of just cutting off their left hand for no good reason and that there's no link. I mean, we would not see that as reasonable. and I don't see it as reasonable either. I think that there clearly is a link and that there is a shared origin story for all of these cultures that are doing this or that have these elongated skulls. So when you want to get to the bottom of a mystery, in my view, you look for the oldest example of the phenomenon. Okay, so that's where you start. And certainly that's the approach I take in, in my work, you know, in human origins research. When I wrote my book, The Forgotten Exodus, The Inter-Africa Theory of Human Evolution, I didn't start at 10,000 years ago, you know, I started by looking at what was happening 5 million years ago and then followed the course from there. And so with this research, you know, I've taken the same kind of route. And so where do we find the oldest examples of elongated skulls? It's not in the Americas and it's not in the Middle East and it's not in Europe. It's actually down in Australia. Specifically, the oldest dated elongated skull at the moment is known from a site called Kabul Creek. That's down in New South Wales, which is the same state I'm currently based in for my own research. Now, at Kubal Creek, there were over a hundred skulls found, several of which had elongation. They also had other archaic features, such as um, very pronounced brow ridges, like large jaws, 
uh, broad faces with a narrow skull case, uh, you know, quite odd looking skulls. And this features again and again in sites that have been uncovered in New South Wales because another, another area called um, Cow Swamp, where multiple burials were discovered, they found that Again, the skeletons had these strange features that a number of them were what they call very robust with these, these prominent jaws, very strong jaws with large teeth, uh, broad faces and you know, prominent brow ridges. In fact, at Cow Swamp, the features were so sort of stark that a number of scientists believed that they'd uncovered Homo erectus burials or some kind of hybrid of modern human and Homo erectus. And of course, Homo erectus is a really archaic hominin form, which is supposed to be extinct for tens of thousands of years. So this would have been, you know, astonishing to find them buried in a site which has been dated at around nine to 14,000 years of age, you know, in Australia, where there's supposed never been any Homo erectus. So obviously with closer research, what they found was that, that these were not Homo erectus, but they certainly had features right on the edges of what can be called the normal range for modern humans, you know, and obviously they had a number of these features clustered into one small population. So it's bizarre by any standard. Now, if it was only at one or two sites, that'd be strange enough. But again, it's not one or two sites. I mean, there's another example known as the Kahuna skull that is like this, which is apparently one of the largest and with some of the, the largest teeth and, you know, a really huge jaw. And there's also a site at Willandra Lakes, which is again as evidenced a peculiar skull in this case particularly thick bone with it being around 19 millimeters thick versus the typical seven millimeters in most modern humans now that's kind of you know bizarre enough but we find that not far at all away from that site we have mungo man which is a 40,000 year old set of remains and in that case the skull was only two millimeters thick right at the opposite end of the scale and not only that, but the skull is really like a, a fully modern human we'd see in Eurasia today, with none of this, none of these other sort of more archaic seeming features like the the brow ridges and the, the large teeth or any of this. So it seems almost as though the the younger sets of remains have got more archaic like morphology than the older set, which is totally the opposite to what we'd expect. So how do we explain this? You know, what is going on here? Right? And the answer is, I feel, that yes, we do have hybrids, but they're not Homo erectus and modern human hybrids, but rather Denisovan hybrids. Now, there's a good reason to think this, and that's because in modern you know, sampling of, of DNA from Aboriginal people, particularly in the north of Australia and in Papua New Guinea, they've detected around 5% of the genes in the genome are from Denisovans. Now, this is the only continent on the world where this signature is found. Even in Central, you know, even in Asia, Central Asia, where the Denisovans supposedly lived, where the Denisova cave was found, you know, they don't find a signature at all. In East Asia, the signature is 0.1% of the modern genome, you know, in Southeast Asia a bit more, but it's only in Australasia and this oceanic region that, um, that we find this really high signature. Now this leads the sensible person to conclude that at least one group of Denisovans were down here, either in island Southeast Asia, somewhere across the Indonesian region, or on Papua New Guinea and in Northern Australia. Consider here that if we go back 12,000 years, that there was no separation of Papua New Guinea from Australia. It was simply one landmass. So any people living there were in contact with the rest of the people on the continent. So any gene flow between them would, of course, have spread. And we can see that it's logical that if a group of hybrids existed in the north, eventually some of them would end up further down to the south. Or, through interbreeding, some of the genes would be passed on to groups. You know. So this would make sense of what we're seeing, certainly in Australia. So that is to say, if we have, you know, if the Denisovans had this, these features, had these archaic features, and also had the elongated heads. Now, how does this fit in with what we see in the rest of the world, and particularly with the Americas, you know, with the Paracas people? Because clearly we're, we're talking about, you know, quite a vast distance between Australia and coastal Peru. What happened? Well, 
I think we can sort of infer what happened now thanks to some DNA results that have recently been released. A team over in the US um, headed up by uh, L.A. Marzulli, who's a researcher into ancient giants and other sort of strange anomalous you know, uh, subjects in prehistory, they managed to sample 12 of these Paracas skulls and got labs in Canada and the US to have a sort of closer look at the DNA. And what the labs came back with was that out of the 12, you know, these 12 skulls, eight of them had mitochondrial haplogroups groups that are quite typical of Native American ancestry. Four of them had haplogroups groups which are very often or most often related to Eurasian people and you know, people of the sort of particularly of Western Eurasia right into the UK, uh, but also of the Middle East. Now, one way of interpreting this data is to think that perhaps there'd been a migration, you know, two to three thousand years ago, involving people from one of those regions, having moved across, you know, by ship, we would assume, but moved across directly to Peru. Now, okay, that's one possible interpretation. But the more logical one comes when you understand how old these particular haplogroups are. And that is because the four that have been flagged up, U2E1, actually goes back to 12,100 to 17,700 years ago. T2B goes back to 8,500 to 15,000 years ago. H1 goes back to 9,000 to 10,800 years ago. And H2A goes back to 8,900 to 12,200 years ago. Now those dates fit very well with the timing of the migrations from Eurasia into the Americas by the Bering Land Bridge. Now we know today that it wasn't a simple fact of people just walking across, but it seems far more likely that groups of people were using boats to sail along the coastline of the Bering Land Bridge uh, on their way into America and sort of hopped their way along and surviving with you know, sea resources, you know, fishing and um, basically, you know, there was, it was easier to do that than to walk across ice uh, where there was nothing. So we now understand that this is what they did. But essentially the time scale there of the migrations at 16,500 to 11,000 years ago matches very well actually with the, the earliest emergence of these four haplogroups. So how did these, what seemed to be, you know, European or Middle Eastern haplogroups become Know, mixed up in these what we these other East Asian haplogroups that are ancestral to Native Americans. Well, these specific haplogroups help us understand because we find that they're closely related to a group of people that used to live near Lake Baikal in Siberia around about you know twelve thousand or more years ago. In fact, the belief to have lived there for most of the ice, last ice age. Here we find the Maltar people. Now, they seem to have had a remarkable culture. They produced all kinds of you know, cloth and tools and uh, many Venus figures and goddess figurines and, you know, and they had a, a well-established culture all across this region. And it just so happens that this region would be an area passed, like quite likely passed through um, by the people moving up from East Asia on their way towards the Americas. So what we can imagine happening is that some of these East Asian groups encountered the eastern edges of the Lake Baikal cultures and that then they mixed with them, probably absorbed cultural elements, but certainly there was a mixing of DNA and that they took with them some of the genetics of these people. And as they moved up, of course, into the Americas, they now were made up of you know, these two different streams of lineages. This is quite sort of fascinating because then you can start to understand now why we see what we consider to be European or Eurasian lineages in these Peruvians. And that's because, you know, this early population at Lake Baikal is ancestral both to modern Europeans and, you know, and people of the Near East and to some of the people in Native America because they lived there before the migrations both to the northeast and to the west right so we can see now why we have this link that these are not these are not people that needed to have sailed you know 2000 or 3000 years ago across to to america but in fact are descendants of these 
these people of the you know of Siberia. So, what else do we get left with from this analysis? Well, we're left with the understanding that clearly that the people in Peru not only have these lineages going back, but may well be wanting to remember important people of the past. And so if, if the Denisovans really were part of this story, and perhaps had these skulls, maybe even had higher intelligence, could it be that some of the people in South America were emulating these forefathers and maybe, maybe did believe that by changing the skull shape that they would be closer to these ancestral people and they in some way tap into some sort of intelligence or spiritual ability that they once had. Or, of course, it may simply be that some of the migrants carried with them very strong links genetically to these Denisovan hybrids and were still being born with these naturally occurring elongated skulls. Now, that's something that we can only solve for sure as new archaeological finds are made and new genetic evidence comes out. But my money is on that this is the solution to why we're seeing these elongated skulls across the world. Okay, well, hopefully you've enjoyed that. So don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to my channel. And, you know, hopefully you'll enjoy some more of my videos. Thank you.